Hi, uh, hope everybody had a great lunch. Um, this is hiring juniors. Uh, past experience does not equal future success. So hello, um, I am Marla Brazell, and I am a software developer from the wonderful city of Denver, Colorado. Um, thank you all for being here today. I am really excited to be giving this talk. Even if this was my initial reaction when I found that I would be speaking to you this afternoon. Very glad my computer is behind a podium so you can't see. Um, I live on the internet as Marla Brazell, just about everywhere. Uh, you can feel free to direct your compliments or complaints uh, to me there. Um, and this is me, probably running away from my computer. Um, this is how I like to spend my free time when I'm not at work, uh, enjoying Colorado's beautiful mountains. And when I am working, I work for a company called Democracy Works. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan civic tech organization dedicated to ensuring that no American should ever have to miss an election. However, this talk is not about this. Instead, I'm going to be talking about this. So I'm curious uh, how many people in the room today uh, consider themselves to be junior developers? Okay, so a couple of people. Um, for the rest of us, I'm going to assume that we are more senior developers, um, and that is precisely why we need to talk today. But before we get started, I have a confession to make for you, or to you. Um, I consider myself to be a junior developer as well. Um, I've been writing code full-time for about two years, been working in tech for about eight years or so, and prior to my job at Democracy Works, I had never written a single line of closure. So I've been around the block when it comes to junior developers. So today I'm going to share a little bit of my experiences with you, and specifically we're going to talk about hiring junior developers. But more specifically than that, we're going to talk about the following things. First, we'll talk briefly about why, why junior developers, um, and why hiring them helps not only you, the person doing the hiring, but them as well. And we'll explore why we want to hire these people now, and maybe why we don't want to hire them now in a few cases. And part of that why will also include talking about who. When we're talking about junior developers, who exactly are we talking about? After we go over those things, we'll dip into the how. We'll talk about how in the sense of how we want to hire junior developers, especially when in many cases they have not written any closure, like myself not that long ago. We'll also talk about the post-hiring house. Once we bring them on board, how are we going to level these people up and set them on the path to becoming senior developers? And then lastly, we will revisit why. And we'll get a bit deeper into this question, talking about why it's not only beneficial to someone seeking a job, but to us as well as we seek to ways to better ourselves, our companies, and the closure community at large. Now, I want to caveat that the term junior developers itself is pretty broad. There are a few different ways that people can get into code. Maybe they're studying CS at college, or they're self-taught, or they're going through boot camp. But we've only got so much time before I get kicked off stage, uh, so we don't have enough time to cover everybody. So this talk is going to focus predominantly on the boot camp variety of junior devs, and will be a little bit less applicable to CS grads. So let's get started. Why junior developers? Well, in order to meaningfully understand the answer to this question, we first have to ask ourselves, what problem are we actually trying to solve? So a show of hands really quickly, I'm curious who has ever posted a closure job and then found that it's kind of difficult to find a group of uh, senior closure developers to fill that position. OK, so you know what I'm talking about. I'll give you a hint. This is probably not your problem. But this might have something to do with it. Uh, this is a survey showing the most used languages in the workplace. There are a couple of these floating around. They're highly unscientific. Um, but the general point here should be pretty obvious. Closure is awesome. That's why we're all here. But it's not that popular in the workplace, relatively speaking. Generally speaking, when we post a job looking for another Clojure developer, we're looking primarily within the Clojure community itself to fill that opening. And as we just saw, that community isn't that big relative to some of the other bigger language communities. In fact, nearly a third of us who filled out the 2016 State of Clojure survey 
indicated that hiring is a major source of frustration for us as we are trying to grow our teams. So assuming that our most immediate goal right now is to fill our job openings, our focus is naturally going to shift to ways that we can broaden that applicant pool. Now, I would hope that the majority of us here are interested in community building in some sense of the word, since you're not typically going to spend your time and money attending a conference if you don't actually want to talk to anybody else who's there. If that were the case, we could just stay home and watch the, watch the recordings from the safety of our couch. But community building naturally is going to entail welcoming newcomers into the community. The key word here, after all, is building. So we could try to do this by appealing to senior developers who maybe haven't written any closure yet. And that's not a bad tactic that we should dismiss. But on its own, it's not going to be enough. The demand for senior talent is already at a fever pitch across the board. And there are a lot of other languages besides Clojure that are competing for these people's attention. So on its own, that strategy is not going to get us quite to where we want to be. But if we look at the data, it actually suggests that we've begun to embrace that notion of community building, whether that's consciously or not. This is from the State of uh, Closure 2015 survey. And you'll see that nearly 40% of the survey respondents here said that they've been writing closure for a year or less. And if we look at that two-year mark, that number jumps up all the way to uh, about 60%, or a solid majority. And assuming that some of the other trends in these surveys are holding true, a lot of us that are in this room right now, myself included, are actually at our very first closure conference. So we've proven that despite the relatively small size of our community, Closure is an attractive option for people who are looking to explore a new language. So let's use that information to our advantage. When crafting a development team, it's generally a good idea to comprise it of more than just senior devs who have been writing your chosen language for a number of years. Organizations as a whole tend to be healthier when they're made up of individuals with a wide range of skill and experience levels. And people are happier at work when they can clearly tie their own learning and growth to that of the organization. So luckily for us, there's no shortage of junior developers who are looking for their first or second job that we can use to round out this mix. So at this point, we need to figure out who these junior developers are so that we can understand where we can find them. This isn't necessarily a straightforward task, as the majority of juniors today are learning JavaScript, or maybe Ruby, or maybe some combination thereof. If we recall from earlier that survey of the most common workplace programming languages, remember that JavaScript is sitting comfortably at the top, and Ruby isn't too far behind. So it makes sense, then, that junior developers are learning generally one of these two languages. Ruby and JavaScript are known for being beginner-friendly. And a lot of juniors are coming out of code schools who are staking their reputation on being able to find their students' jobs after they graduate. So these programs are largely incentivized to teach to where the most jobs are for the highest likelihood of success, right? So we need to understand how we're going to appeal to people who have generally only been exposed to these languages and maybe are less familiar with Clojure. We can start to do this by first considering what junior developers might be looking for. So last year, the collective code school industry in the US graduated somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10,000 new developers. The majority of these people who were going to these code schools were coming in after having spent some amount of time doing some other profession, maybe totally unrelated to code. So consider what it takes to make that switch. First, you have to quit your job. It might be a job that already pays you nicely. You're living comfortably. And then you pay tuition for some of the shorter term or maybe part-time boot camps. This can be a couple thousand dollars. And it stretches all the way up to $20,000 plus for some of the longer programs. Then you forgo a paycheck for three to seven months while you're in school, plus whatever length of time it's going to take you to find a job afterwards. That's an enormous sacrifice. And it's multiplied if you consider that a lot of people have to think about kids or a mortgage or a partner or something like that. So people aren't going to make that change lightly. Instead, people are motivated to make high-risk changes when they perceive that the risk-reward ratio is going to be in their favor. In this case, somebody makes that enormous investment because they think the career payoff is going to outweigh that upfront cost. So junior developers, when they're looking for a job, they're looking for something that is, in part, going to signal the start of that payoff. 
But a lot of juniors know that landing the job is just the first step in their career, and that there's still a ton to learn after that initial amount of schooling. The beautiful thing about career and software development is precisely if you're doing it right, you're always going to be learning something new. I know this, you all know this, and junior developers are especially aware of this. This is the do or die moment for them, where the right job is going to keep them on that path of accelerated learning, and the wrong one might stop them dead in their tracks. So they're looking for a job that's gonna help them continue that momentum that they perhaps started to enjoy in school and see that the investment is worth it. And while this continuing growth is a big driver in how junior developers are selecting their jobs, it's important that we don't forget about the more personal motivations that led them to pursue coding in the first place. This will vary between individuals, but it might, say, have something to do with wanting to make a difference in the world and seeing code as an avenue to get there, or maybe people want to get more involved with some of the cool technology that they're using in their lives, or maybe people feel that they've stagnated in a past career and they want something where that's less likely to happen. So the point of all of this is that you've got to find your hook when you're reaching out to people. We know closure is awesome, but there's only so many people that you're going to hook on language alone right out of the gate, especially when, as we discussed, a lot of juniors are not as familiar with closure. Instead, find a way to speak to their other desires first. At Democracy Works, where I work, for example, we've had a lot of success reaching out to people by emphasizing the civic tech nature of our work. People are really excited to improve elections access in this country, and they get excited about learning closure as a means to solve that problem. So this is a good time for us to take a step back for a minute and th think about what we are looking for as somebody who's hiring junior developers. The one thing I don't want you to take away from this talk is that you should all just run out of here and hire all the junior developers and you know, assume that we're going to figure the rest out as we go. Instead, the rest of this talk makes the assumption that you can enthusiastically say yes to the following things. First, you're ready to take on the challenge of mentoring someone newer to coding, and you understand or want to dig into what that challenge entails exactly. And secondly, you're ready to level up your own career by taking on this challenge and committing to helping someone else level up. In other words, you're not interested in hiring a junior developer because that's the only budget that you could get for another salary, or because you really need somebody with experience, but that job opening has been out flapping in the breeze for a while, and a warm body is better than no body. These are not great reasons to hire a junior developer. But assuming that doesn't apply to any of us, let's talk about how we can go about hiring a not yet closureist for a closure job. Though it's not necessarily straightforward, as we just said, it's also not as tricky as you might think. The ticket here is understanding what you're actually trying to assess in an interview. A junior developer with no closure experience is not going to be your most experienced hire, and that's totally fine, but you can't vet them the same way you would a senior developer. When we're hiring senior developers, you're hiring somebody on this ability to come in and execute from day one, right? But junior developers, you're hiring based on their potential. So you need to look for the following things when you're interviewing them. Do they learn quickly? Can they understand high-level requirements and demonstrate an ability to maybe start translating that into something more technical? Do they ask questions when they get stuck? If these things are, are yes, then it's highly likely that picking up syntax and tooling is not going to be a problem. In other words, the potential here is high. So how would we go about asking those questions? Well, you have a few options. One way you can do this is by presenting candidates with a code challenge enclosure that touches on a topic that they've likely encountered elsewhere in a different domain. A to-do list is a great example. Uh, CRUD apps are the bread and butter of code schools. As you're talking to somebody, they should have these concepts down pat. So this is your chance to, one, verify that, and two, see if they can apply them to a different syntax and set of idioms. Another option you have is to pair program with them on something in Clojure, like the cones. As you do this, you can look for the following things, like are they asking you questions as they go through the exercise? Do they seem to get the hang of it as you progress? Are they having fun? 
Or you can take this a step further and do something similar to what Pivotal does, in which you work together on maybe something that's slightly more involved and still in closure, and you drive to handle the specific syntax concerns while you let them work on fleshing out the actual logic. Or if you don't want to do that, you can pair program on something else entirely. Invite them to bring a problem to you in a language that they're more comfortable with. You can pay attention to things like whether they're comfortable with their tooling or how they go about explaining the problem to you, somebody who maybe is less familiar with that language. Do they make an effort to collaborate with you? How do they respond when you're asking questions? Or if you don't like any of those suggestions, you could review with them some code that they've previously written. Look for attention and care in details that tend to transcend any individual language, like have they written any tests? Are their commit messages good, or are they something like, oh, fix this bug? Uh, is there a readme, or can they iterate on the work they've done? These are the kinds of things that demonstrate good habits that aren't applicable to any particular language and are going to come forward as they join your team. So let's get in our time machine and fast forward in time a little bit. You've hired somebody who seems super promising, and it's their first day, and oh, crap. This is where your hard work really begins. Our how now becomes how do you go about leveling them up and getting what they need to succeed? So I want to do another exercise with you. For the experienced programmers in the room, I want you to try to recall the mental gymnastics that you performed the first time you ever encountered a map, that unfamiliar data structure. Sit there and really try to relive the anxiety and frustration of trying to wrap your head around this concept. What's a map? What do I put in it? When do I use it? Is it the same thing as a hash? Is it a vector? What am I doing here? The fact is, the more experience we have at something, the less we remember about what it's like to struggle. And therefore, the harder it gets for us to relate to somebody who is actually in the middle of that struggle right now, this is what makes successfully hiring junior developers so difficult. Successfully integrating them onto your team and leveling them up requires this constant empathic practice. So we're going to talk about two different kinds of empathy that we need to practice in order to succeed here. The first kind of empathy is technical empathy, and it goes back to what I just mentioned. The more experience we have programming, the less we remember about what it's like to struggle to build that most basic mental map of fundamental concepts. So we've got to anticipate likely sources of friction here and talk about where people are going to struggle so that we can help them out. So to address the obvious first, you've just hired somebody for a closure job, and they don't actually know any closure. So what are you going to do? Getting them up to speed here is going to be the first challenge that you have to overcome. So time to study should be baked into the workday. At the beginning, it might look something like pair programming with this person as much as it possibly makes sense, and maybe leaving little bits of study time at the end to help review concepts that the two of you have gone over earlier in the day. Longer term, it might be something like the 20% time that's been popular with Google or Cognitect. Uh, at Democracy Works, for example, this means that every Friday, 20% of the weekday, for a newer developer is spent studying, maybe starting with the cones and then working on to something more complex. It's a good idea for you to keep a list of ideas in your pocket to help people out if they get stuck, but ultimately, you should let them own this process. This allows them to develop a sense of ownership over their work from the beginning, and they will be able to evolve the difficulty as it makes sense. Tooling is another one. It can be a hurdle for anybody embracing a new language, but it's especially true for closure, land of the endless parentheses, right? And let's face it, Emacs is not exactly known for being beginner friendly. Please don't force a new developer into Emacs land if that is not the tooling setup that he or she is already familiar with. Emacs is a really steep learning curve, and it shouldn't have to compete with closure for valuable brain space. Fortunately, it's no longer the only game of town. Take advantage of this to create a tooling setup that is accessible and minimizes the likelihood that somebody is going to be frustrated and overwhelmed. Don't forget to involve your new teammate in this process. After all, it's their computer, right? Imposter syndrome is another one that gets all of us, but beginners especially so. 
The fear of asking a stupid question is magnified if we don't even know what the question should be or how we're going to phrase it. To help counter this fear, we can create an environment where questions are not only encouraged, but actively solicited on our parts. This is most effectively done by constantly asking somebody what questions they have and inviting them to engage with you, then simply telling them once, yeah, you know, totally cool if you approach me, and then just assuming that they're going to feel comfortable enough to actually come to you when they need help. More concretely, we can carve out a space that's actually devoted to questions. At Democracy Works, we have a Slack channel called Closure Beginners, and it's for exactly what you might expect. It's a place for anybody to ask basic questions, or maybe not so basic, and anybody who's around is welcome to answer at any time. Finally, don't lose sight of the fact that you hired somebody who's new to Clojure, but not totally new to programming in general. Instead, you should be finding ways to leverage what your new teammate already knows from a different language. For example, writing Clojure script requires a knowledge of JavaScript. Take advantage of the fact that somebody already knows JavaScript. Or as for Clojure, don't forget that it's got a robust set of higher order functions for working with collections that are very similar to Ruby's enumerable class. Drawing these types of parallels between Clojure and a previously studied language is not only going to help concepts stick and build that confidence from the start, it's also probably going to challenge you to consider how you, or to stretch how you consider the language. And you might even find that you're learning something new along the way here, too. Uh, recently, I was debugging some Clojure script with a colleague of mine, and I suggested that we throw the JavaScript debugger into our code so that we could examine what was going on at a certain breakpoint. And his response was, I'm sorry, what is that? And I was blown away because this person has many times more programming experience than I do, and here I was teaching him something new to solve our problem. The bottom line is that different things are going to be obvious to different people. Using the JavaScript debugger was a tool that I had reached for 100 times, and it was totally foreign to my colleague, who has much more experience than I do. We're all capable of being rubber ducks for each other here. And the broader or the bigger the spread between our different experiences, the more we potentially stand to learn from each other. So we've talked a bit about technical empathy. But we should all be familiar with this saying, right? Computers are easy, people are the hard part. Hiring a junior developer doesn't mean that you bring someone on board, you slap a book down on their desk, and everything's going to be totally fine in a few weeks. In other words, it gets a little bit trickier. So we're going to spend some time talking about that second form of empathy, which is emotional empathy. As we mentioned earlier, the feeling of being a beginner is like an extreme case of imposter syndrome. Again, it's hard for us to recognize this, maybe, if we've been in the field for a little while, as the memory of what it's like to struggle earlier in a programming career is far less vivid, maybe, than it once was. But there are concrete ways that we can help our new teammate track their progression and start to feel good about the contributions they're making to the team and what they're learning from the start. The first one might seem a little obvious, but it doesn't happen nearly as frequently as it should. You should be holding regular one-on-ones with your teammate. During these check-ins, you need to be doing two things. One, asking how it's going. And two, providing feedback to them. Not just critical feedback, but especially positive feedback. You see, junior developers frequently lack that framework that's provided by past programming jobs to be able to accurately understand their own performance. In this case, no news is not actually good news. Don't make somebody draw their own conclusions about how they're doing. I'm always amazed when I talk to other junior developers, and they're utterly convinced that they are just terrible at this, and they are going to be fired at any minute, and maybe they should just go talk to their boss, because I'd rather quit than be fired. And they go and they say something, and the response is, oh, you're doing great. And nobody ever thought to tell them that and just left them to run away with their own assumptions. The newer the person that is to programming, the more frequently you should hold these check-ins. It's better to check in more frequently, and, or too frequently, and just have to back off a little bit than have that opposite uh, pattern and find yourself stuck on the side of the highway. 
Secondly, you should be setting goals. You should introduce this process, but your new teammate should really drive it. It's a chance for them, the goal setter, to identify the ways that they're hoping to learn and grow in their careers, and it's also an opportunity for you to stay in sync with what motivates them and what they're hoping to learn. So my favorite methodology for goal setting is the 666 model, in which short, medium, and long-term goals are identified, and they correspond roughly with a six-week, six-month, or six-year timeline. These should be a mix of hard technical roles, like be able to write a basic datomic migration without referencing the docs, and other more career-oriented goals, like give a talk at Closure West, even though public speaking sort of terrifies you. There's no real set of rules. You got it. Uh, there's no real set of rules on how to write these, though the short-term ones are going to be measurable and specific, and the longer-term ones are going to be a little bit more vague. Don't forget to actually review these goals as part of your one-on-one. -on -one. Doesn't you know if you write them down, you don't review them, kind of useless. Uh, they should be used as a jumping-off point for conversation to see how somebody's feeling about the work they're doing, but they shouldn't be used as a hard and fast performance metric. But above all, it's important to realize, to really actually fully realize and internalize that in hiring a junior developer, you're making this long-term commitment to somebody else's growth. In other words, it means that as part of this process, the word mentorship needs to be a part of your job description before you bring somebody on. It doesn't mean that you are suddenly a manager. Management and mentorship are not the same thing. But it does mean that you're not going to be typing alone for eight hours a day either, and you're probably not going to be working at your normal pace, at least not for a little while. So keeping an appropriate ratio of junior to senior developers is a key part of being able to appropriately handle this commitment. Three seniors to one junior is generally the ideal here. You might be able to get away with something slightly smaller than that, but the more people that you have able to help honor this commitment, the better off everyone's gonna be. In other words, hire one junior developer to start, not five. So why are we really here? Well. At the beginning of this talk, we touched briefly on the why question. Why do we want to invest time hiring and supporting junior developers? Hopefully it's clear that, yeah, it helps us grow our own careers through mentoring, and we may pick up some new language knowledge along the way. And it's definitely easier to help somebody, teach somebody who's newer to programming good habits that we use on our teams than maybe try to change the habits that we don't like of somebody who's been around for a little longer. But it's also clear that this is indeed an investment. There's no getting around the fact that hiring juniors takes significant time and effort. So we want to know how this investment is going to benefit us long term in addition to the ways that we already talked about. So let's take a look at some numbers. According to a 2014 uh, USA Today survey of about 180 US and Canadian universities, only 4.5% of CS degree recipients self-identified as black. And only 6.5% self-identified as Hispanic. While nearly 61% said that they were white. And according to a different survey of Stanford CS undergrads, nearly 70% of those survey respondents indicated that they were male. So in other words, the vast majority of CS degrees are still going to someone who looks more or less like, well, a lot of the people in this room. But code schools, on the other hand, have been extremely successful at attracting students on the premise that switching to a new career is entirely feasible, regardless of where that individual might be at this point in their life or what their background might be. So consequently, a large number of junior developers if they're coming to, this point, we are coming to this point via the code school route, are career changers, having discovered programming outside of that traditional understanding of school. Their previous career experience doesn't just disappear overnight, even though they're now writing code. The skills that they already have from other jobs, such as specific subject matter expertise from an industry that they were working in, or all of the other non-technical skills that are required of a good programmer, are an asset to your organization as they join your team. Learning syntax is the easy part. There are rules and patterns to follow. 
But there aren't rules and patterns on the other skills, like how to be a good teammate. But luckily, software development is about more than just writing code. We work on teams, and these teams are generally made up of other human beings. Project management skills, communication skills, the ability to deliver critical feedback in a constructive and positive way, these are not the sorts of things that you get better at simply by writing code. And they're not the only, the only strengths that you can pick up just in a software-specific context. So the right junior developer is going to be able to bring these things to the table from day one, and they're likely going to help you grow in this area as well. And these outside skills offer this diversity perspective here that begins to touch on a deeper reason why we need to do a better job of hiring people from a variety of places. Diverse candidates, those who come from underrepresented backgrounds, bring additional perspective to bear. If we think about how the junior developer population is largely made up of people who have traditionally been turned away from programming careers, then it makes sense that welcoming these newer developers onto our teams is going to strengthen all of us by exposing us to different experiences. This translates to richer software, software that is going to account for the needs of a broader swath of people who are going to use our tools in a variety of ways that we couldn't possibly anticipate if we were to stick to hiring people who have all discovered programming in more or less the same way. Now, I can't move on before I debunk the idea here that the only way to find underrepresented candidates is to look to the junior developer pool. That is patently false. Please don't fall into the trap of thinking that a junior hiring strategy is on its own a wholesale diversity and inclusion solution. Indeed, senior women, people of color, and other minorities are frequently assumed to be junior in their skills and experiences simply because of how they present. Rather, I want you to leave here today with the understanding that the junior developer segment can be especially rich in a variety of different people who have different experiences. And if we go back to the original idea of community building, then this is our ticket. What we're really trying to do here is enhance the community. And we do this by learning and growing from each other. Sure, this is primarily done through code. But if we consider that code is a mechanism for storytelling, then our understanding of code can only be broadened and deepened by exposure to many different stories. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope you at least have a better understanding of who junior developers are, how you can successfully integrate them onto your teams, and why this investment will benefit you, your company, and the closure community at large. So with that, it's time for all of us to get to work. Thank you.